Hi, everybody. What we're going to try to do today is just have a conversation about grief. You know, you, and many of you attended my uh, lectures I did on grief. So if you have any questions or things you want to throw at me, even if we don't get to them all today, if you do put them in the chat, I will respond to them. Don't worry. Okay, I'll, I'll just do it privately at the end. Okay, so anyway, um, Loretta's supposed to ask me questions, so I'll have her ask me a question and I'll try to give you an answer, okay? Uh -oh. All right, I have the toughest question for you, but it's the thing everybody wants to know. You shared with us during the uh, grief series a great story about your daughter, but you never told us the end of the story. So for those who weren't with us, <laughs> you have to tell a brief synopsis of the story, but give us an ending, please. What happened to your daughter? Go ahead. Well, first of all, I was just trying to get a point across, and I used the example <clears throat> of my daughter, but it could be any teenager. You know, when she came home from school and they throw the same questions at you, you know, uh, can I go to the dance tonight? <clears throat> can I stay out past my curfew? <clears throat> my curfew is 11 o'clock. And so mom very nicely responds, yes, you can go to the dance, but no, you can't stay out after your curfew. And so my daughter basically, like many teenagers, has a little fit and in normal things like the whole entire school is staying out after curfew. Why can't I? I'll be the only one. You know, you're, you're, you're so hard, you're rotten, you're terrible. I went on a, she went on a tirade. Then after a period of time of yelling and screaming, she went into her room, slammed the door, and called all of her girlfriends and told them what a rotten mother she has. You know, if you raise teenagers, you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so anyway, after about maybe a half an hour of her screaming on the telephone, things quieted down. And then she came back out, walked in the kitchen, and very nonchalantly said to her mom, Hi, mom, what's for dinner tonight? Now, of course, at that point, you know, I'm not going to give you the rest of this. At that point, you know, mom was ready to have her for dinner. You know, because not that it was a good thing that she did, but the thing I was trying to bring across is my daughter had something that many of us don't have. She had a support system when she was upset and she was angry instead of burying it and keeping it in. She ran into her room, got on the telephone and just spewed everything out of her. Then once she got it out, she calmed down, she, feel be she felt better, and she accepted it. You know, in the meantime, mom, you know, who didn't use a support system, basically was at a different place. And so a lot of things could have happened. I'm not gonna give you a, a complete answer on that. But the bottom line is, you know, mom could have, you know, calmly talked to her. Mom could have not calmly talked to her. Mom could have told her that, you know, she's not going to the dance now. Oh, there could be a lot of things, who knows? You know, but the bottom line is, I, want to I wanted to bring out in doing grief work, we go through a lot of changes in our life. And I really feel it's important to have an outlet for those changes. I think what happens to a lot of us is many of us either shut off the grief process, deny it, and maybe try to do it later, and many of us do it indirectly. It comes out sideways in many different ways. But grief is part of life. You're gonna feel grief. And unless you can talk about it, share it, process it, you know, and be able just to get your feelings out. I've learned over a long period of time, believe me, the hard way, to keep feelings in and stuff them. That's how depression comes into your life. Because that's what depression is, anger turned in on yourself. And so the bottom line is, you know, the ending to the story can be a lot of different things. So you're not getting a complete answer to that, are you? Lamar? No, you're dodging, Vince. <laughs> Give you an answer, right, Dot? Give her an answer. Well, why don't you ask Dot what she would have done? <laughs> <laughs> or ask Kathy or ask Nancy or somebody. Right. All right. Keep us in suspense. Okay. That's part of your charm. Hmm. All right, Vince, um, 
into some of the deeper stuff that you talked about. Um, you talked about the good and bad of denial. Could you help us understand that a little better? What's the good, what's the bad? Well, I, I look at denial from two faces. You know, there's good denial and there's negative denial. Denial sometimes is a protection. And sometimes we have to deny things so we're ready to look at them. So I don't always see it as something negative. Because I truly believe you can't handle anything in life unless you're ready to look at it and deal with it. And so sometimes we have to deny for a period of time. We have to hide. And many of us for a long period of time hide, myself included. My mother and father's death, I never grieved the two, the two of them dying until years and years later. I was in a state of denial. I, I could actually say, if I estimate about 44 years in a state of denial to a grief, even the change and stuff to that effect. It took me a long time to finally break through that cloud and begin to make changes. And so there's two faces to it. You know, so there's the positive face and of course there's a negative face where you just freeze yourself and shut yourself down. You avoid and you hide. But you know, like anything else, I mean, the addict, addict, an addict knows what I'm talking about. You know, you're not gonna really deal with your addiction until you're ready to, even though you might think you're dealing with it. It's up here, but it takes time to get down here. That's the key. So, you know, that's what I feel about that. Vince, you brought up your parents. We have a question in the chat that talks about having lost both parents at a young age. And dealing with that Greek was not just was not just having them as I grow up as an adult. How how do I deal with not having them as parents? Well, not being a parent yourself doesn't mean you can't feel the grief of losing parents. So you're talking about losing two parents, right? Right. At an early age. At age. I'll give you a good example of that. You know, I. I think I told this story a long time ago, but I've experienced it a lot when I was a priest. I had many situations where the mother of children died when the children were still young. And basically the children, of course, didn't really know how to deal with grief. You know, a lot of crying, a lot of missing mom. And, but the biggest thing I noticed a lot of times as they got a little bit older and as they got closer to middle, like middle school age, <clears throat> it turned into a lot of anger. You know, and really angry at God, angry at the fact that their parents died, angry at the parents, and also extremely angry at anyone else who kind of stepped in. Let's say, for example, an aunt or an uncle stepped in to raise them. So many times the, the, the ultimate parent, the, the other parent that's assuming a role, we'll get the grief, we'll get the anger, we'll get the frustration, you know. But I, I know when you, as it based on how young the children are, and especially if you deal with really young ones, you know, where basically they never really met their mother. I'll give you an example. I know where a woman, the child survived childbirth, but the mother didn't. And as the child grew up, the child really had no knowledge of of his mother. And so he asked a lot of questions. And people are funny. They might answer some of them, they won't answer the rest of them. And as a result, then very many times, the child stays in a state of confusion, a state of not knowing. And that emptiness, that loneliness can be pretty powerful on the inside. And that's where they need somehow, some way eventually to have an outlet to be able to process what's going on inside of them. And for young people, unfortunately, as they get older, the anger gets deeper. You know, we see examples of kids acting out on other kids through forms of bullying, or we see people basically, you, know, you can act out in a lot of different ways, you know? So, cause I'm gonna tell you the truth. If you hold stuff in long enough, it'll come out, but it might come out sideways and on the wrong people. So, you know, I really feel that's one of the toughest ones of all. The other side of it, when a parent loses a child, is, is just as powerful. Because 
It's not supposed to happen that way. You see, parents are supposed to die before the ch their children die. It doesn't always happen that way. And so the loss of a child, and especially at a very young age, or the loss of a child by an accident, or the loss of a child through drug addiction or overdoses, or whatever it happens to be, and sickness, you know, the loss of a child is so powerful that I really believe it takes years and years and years just to get to a comfortable place, somewhat comfortable, not really comfortable, place where I can finally begin to see that and look at it in different ways. You know, it's interesting, I was reading the paper this morning in the Carrier, and in the obituary section, there was a section that was honoring the gentleman I knew back when he was a kid. I'm just going to use his name. His first name was Joe. And he played on my baseball team. He played in a lot of things. It was always part of my life and part of my journey. But he, he died. He died when he was 25 years old. You know, died at a very young age. You know, and he was sick, you know, for not almost three or four years before he died. And his parents really went through a lot of hell over that death. He never married. And so basically, you know, he was with his parents. And especially if people have to go through a long illness or something prolonged. It's like the grieving process can start way before somebody actually leaves you. For example, a parent could see a child in drug addiction. And as it gets worse and worse and worse, there's that thing in our head that eventually they're going to get that phone call. That eventually they're going to hear and that eventually they're going to lose someone. That's a powerful pain. And that's something people have to go through way before it even happens. The anticipation of something to happen. That can be in a sickness. That can be a lot in the sickness of addiction. Can be a lot of different things. You know, you see it very many times when you look at hospitals where kids are being treated for cancer. You know, kids that are, you know, three months old, year old, year and a half old, and what the parents have to go through to watch that process. Sometimes it comes out good and sometimes it doesn't. And so it's almost like no matter what happens, we're going to feel it. We're going to go through it. We've got to be in touch with our feelings. And somehow, somehow have some kind of a support system to be able to talk about it. And I'll share one more thing with you on that. When people feel that deeply and they need to share or vent, please, please don't give them advice. Just listen. People need people just to listen because I know a lot of things may come out that make no sense at all. So it's not that important. It's a good question though. It's a powerful question from both sides, from parents losing a child and, and a child losing a parent. Same thing. Well, especially, you know, if you look at a child that's in middle school or early teenage years, and the surviving parent starts to date again. It starts to, you know, go back out there. The person they're dating could, could get it. You know, that's all part of it. Everything's a process. It takes time. It's a good question though. Vince, you talk about sadness and you talked about um, sort of in the same frame as denial that um, you know, there's good and bad to it. Are there coping uh, mechanisms to say, to get the sadness to lift or to, you know, how does one move from sadness to see even neutral? Well, let's try to remember something. And Kubler-Ross says this very clearly. The grieving process on paper has five stages. But in reality, those stages never really go in order. You, when somebody dies, you're gonna go through sadness. You may go through acceptance. You may do this intellectually. But eventually, you know, 
you may go back to bargaining. That's where the shoulda, coulda, would is thing. If I could do this, I shoulda did this, I shoulda did that. If only I had done this. We go back and forth and we juggle around. So the grieving process can take on all those five faces constantly. I can go through a period of denial and a period of anger. Then I can go through a period of sadness. And so, you know, you really, you can't pinpoint the emotional system because all of our emotional systems are different. For many of us, we may even need, you know, psychiatric help to get through some of this. You may need therapy or counseling, grief counseling especially is a good thing, but even grief counseling. So many times people started too soon. You know, somebody dies, the next day they're calling a grief counselor. Well, even, even grief counselors in hospice always wait till after the funeral is over. And in time, they start coming back to the process. So it just takes a lot of time, you know. And I think that's the thing, you know, I can talk about this till doomsday, but I can't predict how it's going to work for different people. Everyone handles it differently. I told you this that man is so his son commits suicide. You know, well, we had a situation recently where a mother experienced a child committing suicide inside of her house. And the only way she could deal with that was she could never go back in that house again. So eventually, they, she stayed with a relative, but eventually the rest of the family had to move because that place became something that just triggered everything inside of her. So again, who knows? Now, I wish I could get inside the, 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 the psychic system of people, then my job would be a lot easier. But I know how it works for me. And I know I need to be able to express my feelings. I'm grateful for 12-step programs. I'm grateful for having sponsors, people I can you know, talk about, I can scream, I can yell. I'm grateful for my wife who gives me a lot of support. You know, but I mean, you have to build a support system for yourself. It's so important. But again, none of this takes place overnight. You might find yourself being angry for a long period of time. The other one is somebody mentioned to me about the should as the could have and that kind of stuff. You know, sure. You know, one of my therapists, Alice Hunkins, gave me a plaque, which I keep on my wall right up here. And it says, do not shoot on yourself today because the shooters can really do a number on you. You know, sure. You can be a, a second guesser to a lot of things. Somebody dies in a hospital. My cousin went through that. His, his wife died in the hospital and he beat himself up for years because he gave permission for the operation. She died on the table. It was his fault. She died. And really it wasn't. But it took him a long time to deal with that. So, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you could think you've de dealt with something and down the road, it's not there. And you always say that the thing about, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, that, that you shouldn't stay in that bad neighborhood of the mind sometimes with the should have, could have, would have. But are there tricks to like get you to think about something else or do something different? Well, once again, the, the best thing you could do is talk about it. You know, sometimes you need to cry about it. You may, may even need to go through guilt. That's a feeling like anything else. But that's the best way. The other ways for some people, they just go about their life and stay busy, 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 busy not have to feel it or deal with it. Everyone has their own coping mechanisms in many different directions. For some people, they can literally make things black and white. And basically it's, it's, it's how they deal with life. You know, who can explain any of that? But the bottom line is you have to realize the fact that every one of us, no matter who we are, we need some kind of an outlet. You know, the gym might be an outlet. You know, for a couple of years, I used to really 
pound my fist on the heavy bag because I had the right kind of gloves to do it. Please don't do that with your bare knuckles because you'll break them. You need to have the right kind of gloves to do that. But the bottom line is it's an outlet. You know, sometimes just a good friend of mine, when he feels these intense feelings of grief, drives to Cooper River Park with his windows up and just screams and yells and screams and yells and gets all his feelings out. He just blows his feelings out, you know. He tries to make sure nobody's around so they won't get him committed. But basically, he literally let, lets loose. People need that sometimes. You know, a friend of mine he used to actually, he had a boat and he lived right by the ocean down in uh, Ventnor. And he would basically take his boat out on the ocean by himself and just stand and scream and yell and call names and do all kinds of crazy stuff. You have to find whatever works for you. One of the things I realized though, a lot of people use their pets as an outlet for grieving. You know, it's really interesting in nursing homes and places now, they're beginning to have like cats and things of that effect, pets, because sometimes you, you can't talk to someone, you can actually talk to your pet and you feel close to it. You can let your feelings out and your pet will listen to you. you know, so there's a lot of different ways people have been able to handle situations. A lady who lost her baby, you know, had her room all set up for the baby. We've seen this before. She had the nursery all set up. She closed the door of the nursery and locked it and wanted no one in the house to go inside that room. It was that way for a couple of years until finally she broke through. Yep, that was her coping mechanism. And I really feel because, you know, it, it, it sounds nice to sit here and say, oh, have an outlet, blow steam off. It doesn't work that way. That only happened when you're ready for it to happen. And many times it will happen at the time you don't even know it's going to happen. It's all part of it. A good friend of mine, you know, experienced this a few months ago where she was very busy working with the person that died. She was really the coordinator and stuff for the person. And then maybe about a month and a half later, she was sitting in her living room watching TV and all of a sudden started screaming, started yelling. All of a sudden she began to get angry at this person she has spent so much time taking care of that died. Who knows when it comes on? You know, like I said, I wish I could get a chart and tell you day one, day two, day three, day four, but it's impossible. It's not just with somebody dying though. It's also with the loss of a job. The ending of a relationship is one of the most powerful forms of grieving, powerful form of grieving, you know, because let's face it, if you had invested five, six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen 10, 15 years in a relationship and it doesn't work, there's a lot of anger, a lot of denial. You can even say wonderful things like, well, I'm glad he's out of here. Let me get rid of him. But deep down inside, you're angry at yourself because you invested so much in that relationship and it didn't work. So the grieving process can be pretty strong in a lot of different areas of our life. That's why I mentioned last week when I talked about different forms of death, watching things come to an end. You know, just to give an example, I was talking this morning with Dr. Goldberg, one of our psychologists. He was here and he saw a photograph on the wall of my therapist. And we got in this conversation. And I realized, you know, it took me almost took me almost 10 years to finally, finally deal with saying goodbye to the priesthood, doing a change in my life. That was the scariest thing I ever did in my life. And it took me a long time to say goodbye. It was hard. But sometimes you need concrete things still. So for example, I've done things here at Starting Point in the back of our, our building here. We have a thing called um, 
a recovery cemetery. And a lot of times I work with people where they wrote letters to someone they wanted to say goodbye to. And so many times they also had a tendency very many times to, you know, bring a piece of the clothing or something to that effect. We did a funeral service. We, we did a goodbye service, stuff to that effect. People need concrete things a lot of times too. Even going to the cemetery to say goodbye. It's all part of it. You know, I was telling Loretta the other day, growing up, my family, and this are many Italian families, I know m many of you who are local, you know where Calvary Cemetery is in Pensalkin, you know, and I, I would say 85% of my family is buried there. And of course, a lot of other families too. But when I was a kid on Sunday morning after church, families would actually go to the cemetery, put a blanket down on the grave and have a family picnic just to be able to include the person in their family. That was tradition when I was a, when I was a kid, you know, and you can see in the cemetery, you can see people with their blankets all over the place back then. You know? And then we had so many people buried there that we had, we had to change grave, grave sites every different week to honor the person. Then we would sit there and talk. It's like the person was sitting there. The stone was there, but they weren't. And, but you know, that was just, that was a tradition. There's different ways in which people do grieving. You know, that one particular lady, 26 years ago, she lost her son, you know, and she put it in the column today, how she's still, still to this day, 26 years later, still misses him. And so her form of grieving was to put a photograph of him and to basically put it in the paper, all different ways. Vince, we have a question here about um, a series of deaths in a short period of time. Um, the instance that is here is I've lost 10 people in the last 10 months, including a sister, a brother, a cousin, and seven friends, some closer than others. Um, I have a friend of 30 years that is now diagnosed with cancer and another friend who is on a ventilator. How do I cope? What are the tools to pull on? That is a tough one because when you're experiencing, especially death, with a large number of people, we see this a lot of times in situations where families, you know, lost each other, went through all kinds of different types of things. Okay, that type of that that type of loss can be so powerful that it can literally immobilize you. It can literally shut you down. It can bring you to a point where literally, literally, you don't know what's going to happen next. And the scary part about it is, and people lose people in a short period of time, like 10 months or whatever, you know, it's almost like I'm going through this constant process of saying goodbye. You know, and part of me now doesn't wants to be able to say hello. So that means that loss is on top of loss is on top of loss. And it's scary. You know, I know an individual that I love dearly who was a refugee to this country and lost members of her family on the way in some of the camps as they made their, their way here, never found them again. They don't know if they're dead or alive. And that's a much more powerful thing too. Somebody dies in a boating accident or Let's say the family goes on an outing and there's an explosion and a group of people, a large group of people perish. Again, once again, it's scary because when you can't actually see the person and see them dead, there's a part of you in here that says, maybe they're still gonna show up. Maybe they were able to get off the boat and they went swimming and they're someplace else right now. I mean, your mind can drive you in a lot of different places, especially when groups of people die. We see this in the war, when, when many, many women lost their, lost their husbands, lost their boyfriends, lost a lot of people. 
And as a result, then we see that where a lot of people went through what I call group grieving together too. So it's, you know, there's no simple answer to it. You go through that many losses, you know, it's, it's overwhelming. And you need something to hang on to and some people to hang on to. It goes back to my talk back in the beginning for any type of grieving, you need to be able to express your feelings. You need, you need a support system. You need support. Please don't try to do it on your own. It doesn't work. Believe me, I found that out the hard way. It does not work. I still grieve my father's death. He died when I was 26 years old. Just a lot of years ago. And I still grieve his death. I miss him tremendously. Now, the other thing too, very many times, People have a tendency to go through a heavy grieving process on anniversaries. The anniversary of someone's death or the birthday of someone you were close to. There are what I call trigger points that literally open up the grieving process again because, you know, anniversaries, birthdays, things that were really close to you, they make a big difference. That's one of the reasons why we have a memorial wall here to try to remember and not forget people, which is important. Are you there, Loretta? I am. I'm sorry. I had to turn off my phone. <laughs> um, we have another question about um, the day my husband died. I was unkind. It was a sudden death. Um, said things that I wish I didn't say. Um, any advice there? Again, that's normal. That's part of the anger process. When somebody close to you dies, they don't know how to handle it. So I can actually get angry at the person, get angry at God, get angry in a lot of different ways. You know, and then later on, oh, I should have, I should have been, I should have did it differently. I should not have, I should not have done it that way. There's the shoulds again. But the bottom line is you're going to feel some guilt because you're angry, you know, especially if someone close to you dies suddenly, you know, yeah, it's normal to be angry at them. I just think that's where sometimes we get, we get, we get tied up because many of us were taught, myself included, don't get angry, always be nice. You're not allowed to have that feeling. Anger is a very healthy feeling. Sometimes you really got to get angry at people. I've been in hospitals with people when someone has died, but I give the last, I've given the last rites, you know, and I, I can see them very, you know, really cursing the person, doing all kinds of stuff and then crying, combination of so many different things, and the emotions of that. It's, that's part of sadness, by the way, which is pretty normal. You know, like I said before, even if you take it in other areas, you know, relationships and things to that effect, you know, so many times, you know, you, you may spend days and days and days being angry at your supervisor or your boss that told you a simple little thing like, we're, we're hiring younger people that have more computer knowledge. Okay, so we'll give you a nice severance pay, but it's time for you to retire, even though you don't want to retire. That's grounds for a lot of anger and a lot of frustration. It happens to a lot of people. And so that feeling of anger deep down inside of us, we get angry at a lot of things. We get angry at the world that we live in, that the chaos, the confusion, the things that go on in the world. You know, but we got to be able to realize that that's all normal. It's all normal. We're human beings. We have feelings. Feelings need to be expressed. But I also know I need to have people I can trust enough and feel safe enough to express them with. And that's where many times we make a mistake because we let it out on the wrong person at the wrong place and then make them back to haunt you a little bit, different directions. You know, I've seen it many times, you know, and not to have a little bit of humor, but humor is part of the process of grieving too. You know, I remember when I was a kid, we used to have professional criers. People that literally went to funerals, didn't even know the person. 
oversupply the crying, the crying. You know, they got paid for doing it. It's amazing. You know, and at the same time, it's almost like I really can't express my feelings. So I'm going to pay somebody to do it for me. Is that a good thing? At that point, maybe it is. Maybe I need somebody else to do it for me. I don't know. Is it good? Is it bad? I, I don't get into good and bad anymore. I think people have coping mechanisms and they can do it in different ways. And it's all part of it. And some people can be very cold. You know, let me tell you a funny story. It's funny, but not funny. Okay, because, you know, Dot wanted me to tell the story, so I gotta tell it. Anyway, when I was 18 years old, you know, I was home for the summertime from the seminary, and my mother was in the kitchen. The man across the street was in a wheelchair. My mother did all of his food shopping and helped him out. So she got her shopping list, went across the street, she wanted to get his shopping list and go shopping. She came home with her bags of groceries. She was putting them away, and I just asked her a simple question. How's Salvatore doing? She went over to get a shopping list and he was dead. I said, he's, he's what? He said, he was dead. I said, did you call the family? Not yet. And she looked at me like I was, I said, I got this, what are you getting upset for? She said, he'll be just as dead an hour from now as he is now. I had to get my shopping done first before I went and told people. But see, you have to realize something. Many immigrants and people coming from the old country, people that experienced early deaths and stuff to that effect, it's how they dealt with it. It's how they dealt with it. Now, is that a good way, a bad way? I don't know. But, you know, everybody's got their own way in which they deal with stuff. You know, and I, I could smile a little bit and look at that and say, wow, it's pretty cold. But no, they, you know, because the old traditions years ago were when somebody died, the family got together and it was like a big party. You know, there were tons and tons of food arrived and other liquid refreshments and a lot of crazy things. And people, everybody looks at it so differently. You know, some of the families actually have dances and parties for three days to celebrate someone's death. You know, so I think we have to look within our own selves and say, What's, what's the best coping mechanism for me? Can we tell you a secret? You can plan it, but it ain't going to work. Sorry. Because you're going to be surprised how that process will come out. It'll come out in God's time, not in your time. Isn't it fun to be a human being? All these feelings and things that go on inside of us. And we're living a real world. We're, we're all going to die at one time or another. We're all going to go through a lot of changes at one time or another. There's no plan. You know, there's no way that you can predict anything. Why does somebody die so young? I don't know. I can answer all these questions. I wouldn't be here. I'd be someplace else. So, you know, we have so many whys, and yet, just part of that grieving process. I do recommend, if you ever get the opportunity, <clears throat> to read Kubler Ross's book on death and dying. It's not a big, thick book. You know, and she so emphasizes the fact that she can teach you a format, you know, for grieving, but nobody follows the format. It's just a format to help you along. You might go through you know, the anger bargaining stage in, let's say, 2010, and then end up going through the sadness stage in 2019. I can't predict that. You never know. I may have to handle it intellectually for a long period of time before I begin to get in touch with my feelings. How do you do that? Stay busy. I did it when I was in the priesthood by running around, being busy, 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 taking care of everybody else's stuff. Spent a lot of years avoiding looking at me. Uh, you know, eventually, what do you have to do? Look in that mirror and deal with it. So, a lot of faces. I wish I could give you 
an exact thing, but it'd be impossible. I mean, you go through a grieving process every day as soon as you get a day older. Congratulations. How many times, you know, I mean, I went through this this past weekend, you know, and I'm paying for it right now. So the grieving process can tell you, because sometimes you think you can do things you can't do. So I decided somebody asked me to bring a case of frozen chicken to the chicken to the food bank. They donated it. It was a 50 pound thing of, of chicken. So Mr. America here decided that he was going to carry it. We had to go in the freezer into our clubhouse and then trans we, was that we couldn't transport it till Monday. And so as an idiot, I picked it up, you know, and guess what? I was at the chiropractor this morning because I pulled, I pulled my back muscle out, you know, because, you know, and my chiropractor said it to me this morning. She said, isn't it nice to think that you're 20 years old again? <laughs> and I had, I had a few words in my head I wanted to say to her too, but she so couldn't pick it. She couldn't pick it. Isn't that a great way to end this where we have to ask for help? Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Cause that is something that you preach all the time. And obviously you didn't do it. Of course not. <laughs> Cause I was going to be Mr. Wonderful, Mr. Fantastic. I could do it. You know, I tell Kathy all the time I could do it. I, I picked that sucker up and boy, something popped, you know, and so I guess I got to just keep going to the chiropractor and the PT until it subsides. I get to visit all my friends at PT anyway. You know, if you live in Holiday City, by the way, there's a place called Advanced Physical Therapy. It's a reunion of Holiday City is what it is. <laughs> Every time you go, I met people I even know lived in my development. It's amazing. They have a sign on the door. You'll be back <laughs> on top of the door. <laughs> well, with that, Vince, I think that uh, everyone, uh, I hope we answered some of the questions and thoughts that you had. Um, we really appreciate you joining us. And if you'd like to unmute yourself, we can certainly say the serenity prayer, Vince. I think that's a good way to end don't you i just want to mention too if anybody else does have questions you can always you know text text me with them or email them i'll, I'll try to the best of my ability if i can't answer them i'll talk to our two grief counselors to try to get an answer of that. Mm -hmm. okay